Okay, I think we can get started. It's four o'clock, and yeah, people can drop in uh, as they would like. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, this is my first time visiting a conflict management camp, and it's typically not some my dom my, my day domain of uh, operations. And uh, I've been joining the sessions today. I've been learning quite a lot, uh, and I'm here to share a bit about the domain that I work in, which is uh, Internet, of, Internet of Things and Embedded Devices. Uh, with the focus, of course, uh, the common domain is the Linux. Uh, that's the combination. Um, and I will try to share yeah, the challenges of Internet of Things at scale. Uh, oh. Yeah, there is a connection uh, with Config Management Camp and what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I work with the, for, with the company uh, Northern Tech, which is also the company that's working on CF Engine. Uh, but Northern Tech has also a different product called Mendor.io, uh, which is an over-the-air software update solution for embedded Linux devices. And it operates in this different domain, and I'm, today I'm going to share some of the key things and or key differences. Uh, my experience, I'm uh, nearly a decade in embedded Linux, uh, meaning that I've been building products with uh, Linux embedded, uh, and I will get into a bit more about this definition and what it means. Um, and yeah, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. It's uh, a lot more fun when, when people are engaged and, uh, instead of me talking. I have a lot of slides and stuff to say, but still. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to mention that uh, Mender has been around for a while and it's been uh, recognized by the European Union and is part of the Horizon 2020 uh, project, where we have yeah, received recognition and funding as well. Um, so Internet of Things, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, but Internet of Things is a very broad uh, concept and uh, it's a very confusing field. Uh, so this is the Wikipedia definition of what it is. Uh, connected devices, sensors, uh, that's the basically the gist of it. Uh, and I will probably say Internet of Things quite a lot during the presentation, but what I actually mean is embedded Linux. So there is this complete domain of microcontrollers and real-time operating systems uh, that op that's exists in, in, inside the Internet of Things, but I will not talk so much about that and focus only on the yeah, embedded Linux applications. Uh, yeah, to further confuse uh, everyone, so everyone makes makes their uh, makes up their own name uh, for the same thing. So the Internet of Things is actually a collection of all, all of these, which is a yeah Internet of Everything, Industrial Internet of Things, which are kind of subdomains within the same thing. Uh, and I mean, the common thing is that they are connected somehow to the cloud or to the to servers uh, but are embedded into uh, devices so a couple of example vehicle to everything is what uh, the automotive is promoting as their uh, prerequisite to like autonomous drive um, where the vehicles are connected and are communicating with each other and so on um, so yeah uh, and as I already said, I will focus on uh, the Linux stuff, uh, Linux side of Internet of Things, and not so much on uh, real-time operating systems and so on. And this is a good example of yeah, what is Internet of Things and uh, where it's where is Linux running? And it's basically in everything around us. Uh, I kind of find it funny to find these. Uh, yeah, when things go wrong, you can see. Uh, what's running behind, uh, and it's typically a Linux, some kind of Linux distribution. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, it's in yeah, vehicles and so on. Uh, yeah, this one has, has I've actually taken as well at a science fair in uh, Sweden. Uh, Saturn is having a problem, I think. <laughs> and you could actually see that they were using a Raspberry Pi to drive them. So. Funny, uh, like a work damaged. 
Uh, but era of usage, uh, this kind of grew out of these domains where uh, Transportation and automotive has, have been using these type of technologies for quite a lot of time. Vehicle telematics, fleet management, uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, so you kind of monitor a fleet of vehicles to predict maintenance, but also to monitor where they are and so on. And more and more it's becoming um, more common to run Linux in a, like in vehicle infotainment as well, uh, and so on. And then we have construction and buildings, uh, where it's a very popular domain. So smart city operations, smart buildings, or building automation, monitoring, and similar applications in all of them. And energy is also a uh, yeah, pretty common area. And then we all have the things, which is everything else, everything, the wearables, the, yeah. Uh, it's hard to cover them all uh, you know, in one slide, but there's a lot of things that have a Linux built in that is communicating over the internet. And I wanted to talk about a bit about the environment that these devices operate in because it's a bit special. Um, so, so like suddenly your uh, Linux server uh, has gotten wheels and is moving around. And these, this kind of poses some kind of some new challenges that didn't really exist before, and uh, some of the tooling or solutions that exist today are were not designed with this environment in mind. So I want to explore this a bit more: the environment that these devices operate in. So typically, it's uh, devices are remote and they are very expensive or, or impossible to reach physically. So it can be top of the mountain, at the bottom of the sea, in the forest somewhere, in a vehicle embedded behind the dashboard. So you cannot really get physical access to the device. And this poses some challenges, of course, that uh, if something goes wrong, it's not a VM that you can just reboot and so on. So you kind of have to prepare yourself for that once you have uh, deployed this device, you will never physically reach it again. Uh, I mean, you could, but it's very costly to do it. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, typically, there's a very long expected lifetime of these devices. Uh, so if you embed something into a vehicle or into a car, uh, and a car lives for 20 to 30 years, uh, this thing is supposed to be operational, right? Uh, so there are a lot of considerations, and I mean, and this is where software updates come in. If you have a device that's going to be connected to the internet for five to ten years, and you cannot physically reach it, uh, you need some way to keep this device up to date with security patches, uh, bug fixes, uh, but also fe adding features or uh, modifying the features of the devices. Typically, the long expected lifetime, uh, I mean, poses new challenges that were not really present before. Um, and in many cases, these devices are connected to unreliable power. Uh, so they can be suddenly up unplugged, they can be running on battery, and the battery can expire. Uh, so there's a lot of corner cases around that. that uh, and I mean, as I mentioned, you don't want your device to break if it lose, loses power. Uh, and you want wanted to recover from that. And typically, they, I mean, unreliable network. So if your device is in a vehicle that's moving around uh, and is communicating using mobile connectivity, obviously some areas have uh, yeah, lower bandwidths or lower connectivity or signal. So you kind of have an intermittent connectivity, or you can lose connectivity at any given time. For, for periods. Um, and I also want the long expected lifetime. I also want to come back to that. I forgot to mention one thing, and it's managing wear of flash is a thing uh, in these. So if, you, if your device is going to live 10 years, you kind of need to keep in mind that, I mean, a flash has a mm, finite number of writes you can do, uh, and that you kind of need to keep in mind. And there was recently a pretty good example, Tesla, which is uh, running Linux in their infotainment systems. Uh, and there were reports that uh, these infotainment systems were breaking down. 
And what basically what it turned out to be is that they were writing too much to their EMC, EMMC flash, and they were breaking basically, and which was a costly repair. To they had basically had to re replace the infotainment uh, of, of the vehicles. So even the like, the big ones can get this wrong. Uh, it is challenging. And continuing on the environment, high volumes is fairly easy to reach. I mean, these are pretty low cost devices. So, you, and once you reach 1,000 or 10,000 devices, you cannot get these scalability problems. How do you manage all of your devices and how do you update all of these devices and so on. So there's a lot of uh, considerations in that regard. Uh, constraint on resources. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of pow quite powerful devices. So for example, this that I'm showing here um, can be configured with one to eight gigabyte of RAM. Uh, it has only like eight gigabyte of eMMC, but it's a quad core ARM64, so it's pretty powerful. Uh, but there are still use cases maybe where you have megabytes of RAM instead of gigabytes and uh, megabytes of flash as well. But it's I mean, memory has gotten cheaper and cheaper, so usually these devices are quite powerful nowadays. Uh, and one final thing about the environment is that um, you typically don't give the users access to your device, so they cannot go in, open, open a terminal or edit anything on the device. So what you install during production or what you deploy to the device, that is what is there. Uh, and there's no. Uh, possibilities to configure you are the, the the product owner or the company behind the product is the owner of the code that's running. Um, um, yeah, and moving on a bit. So there's <coughs> devices, and these devices are connected to something. Uh, there are many cloud IoT platforms, probably in the hundreds. But yeah, there's Google IoT Core, Azure IoT Hub, uh, Amazon has their own thing, IBM has their own thing, GE has their own platform. So there's all these platforms that you kinda can connect your devices to, send data, uh, and then post-process that data to do analysis, uh, whatever your application is. Uh, but typically, uh, you would use one of the cl cloud vendors, or you could roll your own cloud infrastructure, basically, which is not uncommon, actually. Uh, so I wanted to dig deeper a bit on uh, the anatomy of the embedded Linux device. I mean, an uh, embedded Linux device is not special in any way. It's, it's, it's a Linux device. Um, there is a bootloader, there is a Linux kernel, and then you have the root file system where your applications live uh, and the system binaries and so on. Um, the one thing that's causing a lot of um, problems or uh, that makes this area quite unique is the dominance of ARM uh, processors uh, and the lack of standardization in ARM. Uh, and we're going to get back to that. Um, but uh, yeah, this is the typical Linux system. And there's not much. Uh, and on ARM, you use something like that's called device tree, which is the equivalent of BIOS. That kind of is the hardware description that tells what's connected where and so on, and what device drivers to load in the Linux kernel. So it's just a hardware description uh, file. Um, and I wanted to talk about some common design patterns because if you look uh, at the environment and all the challenges that we po that we impose uh, on this environment uh, there are some very common design patterns and this is going back 20 years this is how embedded devices have been designed to handle these uh, unreliable power under unreliable connectivity uh, fail-safe mechanisms if something was wrong and so on. And this is one of something called asymmetric, uh, where you, you, have a, you, you have a bootloader and then you have the main operating system, which you keep immutable so you cannot write anything. And this is the, related to this wear or flash. Uh, so you don't want to have an unnecessary write. Um, 
Typically, you have a persistent data per separate partition. So if you want to do writes, that's where you would do it. Um, and that's also where you keep the state. Hmm. But you also keep a, like a recovery OS. Uh, so if something goes wrong with, with the main operating system, you can always come back. Uh, and this is how, also how you would update the system. Uh, you would download some kind of image uh, to the device, reboot into the recovery OS, flash the main OS again, and then kind of boot it. Uh, and this is, I mean, uh, this is how Android used to do it. If you remember, you, you get a notification on your phone, there's an update, it rebooted, and then you waited 20 minutes for it to install, and then kind of uh, rebooted. Uh, to back to the main OS. So it's a very common, a bit simplified of course, but uh, it's a very common technique used in these uh, systems. There is obviously downsides with this approach. Uh, there is a downtime while you are uh, updating the, the system because you need to be in this recovery OS. Then the device is basically unusable during the update in that case. And you also need to reserve some location where you're going to uh, where you're going to store the intermediate image, so that both the main the main OS downloads it, but the recovery OS installs it. Any questions so far, uh, or because I'm kind of going to build on top of this a bit more. So if it's uh, yeah, it's clear. Okay. Uh, so the next approach, uh, which is actually how Android nowadays works, uh, is a symmetric uh, approach. And it's basically building in redundancy. So you have two full copies of your operating system. Uh, you have an operating system A and a B. Uh, the, all, in this case, A is active, B is inactive. Uh, so whatever is run, your runtime is on uh, A. Still read-only, because you don't want to keep any state on that, and you don't want to keep any writes. Um, and this approach is also image-based, so you... And in this case, you don't have the, down, the, the, the downside of uh, downtime. So while your OSA is running, it can download an image and flash OSB, which is just an inactive area. Uh, it's it's going to flash. Uh, and then you can kind of switch. Uh, you do a reboot and switch. And if it doesn't work or you run into issues, so you kind of run some sanity checks when, once you booted and it doesn't work, you always have the possibility to kind of go back to the uh, previous working state. Uh, so you have the fail safe, you have the rollback. So no matter if you get a power loss or lose network connectivity or whatever happens, you can always fall back to a known working state. The obvious downside here is that you need it is storage overhead because you need to have two full copies of your operating system. Uh, and something I maybe I didn't mention so far, but it's maybe clear from the pictures, is that uh, there is an integration with the bootloader in this case, so it's the bootloader that, that does the switching and also does the rollback if it detects uh, that this new image didn't boot, and then the bootloader kind of detects that and rolls back the, the device. And then the kind of lately uh, there's been some kind of combinations of things. We obviously have containers which have exploded and uh, are quite usable or very much used in the server world and so on. Uh, and these technologies are transferring to this world as well. But kind of combining, I mean, container solves the, in some cases, the deployment of the application. But you still have the, all the underlying stuff, the container runtime, the Linux kernel that you want to update. Uh, and that's why you still use this symmetric, but combine it with uh, a container runtime, so you can deploy applications using container technology, which is familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but as I said, it's still uh, image-based. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll continue. So, I mean, obviously there are some challenges. 
uh, and the primary ones are working, I mean, the, the approaches I've showed you so far are all working with images. Uh, so you basically, you're, you build a full root file system image and that's what you deploy to the device. Uh, so there is a, how do you do this? How do you build these images? Uh, so you, you need to be able to have, to have re reproducibility, uh, traceability and so on. But you also want your images that you generate uh, to stay up to date, so so you can do frequent releases with the latest security patches and so on. And obviously, software updates, um, solving the yeah, transferring this payload from somewhere to this device, and ensuring that um, yeah, it doesn't break if something was wrong and so on. Uh, and especially for, from a security perspective, these type of devices are uh, very attractive to something called botnets uh, that kind of scan the internet for these connected devices and exploit well-known uh, vulnerabilities and so on. And then they kind of inject Trojans and then they can do, uh, do, do things. Uh, and one, one example a couple of years ago was the Mirai botnet which kind of, this one was focused on an IP camera that had like well-known login credentials, so it was admin-admin or something like that. Uh, and this like Mirai botnet was just scanning the internet and trying to log in to these uh, devices. And they actually acquired like two or 300,000 devices that they infected. And then, then they used this to do a denial of service attack, basically on the internet on the west coast in the US and taking down sites, sites like GitHub, Spotify, PayPal for a short period. Uh, and that's why like these, that's why the Internet of Things and these connected devices is still in, a, in its infancy um, and there's a lot of regulation coming out around this so you're not allowed to have an admin admin password if you ship your device and connect it to the internet because even if you don't care about security, I mean, someone can still infect it and use it uh, and do malicious things. So there's a lot of r regulation around this coming uh, coming up, I think. And there's a other, Mirai is just one of them. There's plenty of these botnets that do. There was one called uh, Brickerbot, but this was a, like a white hat Trojan. So it uh, bricked all the devices it infected. So it kind of disabled them so no one else can infect them and do something else. Uh, but, uh, there are uh, many devices out now which is not affected by those new regulations. Uh, yeah. Historically, there have been many bad devices out, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they are still out there. It's hard to, I don't know. I mean, there's just recently, I think in California, but it only like affects devices in California, I think. Uh, so if you're shipping a product, uh, you have to kind of fulfill a checklist. Don't, all your devices have unique login. If you're going to have lo logins, they're going to, and there's this, but it's still very early. Uh, and in the European Union, I mean, it's being discussed, but there's no laws yet. Or, uh, but eventually it has to be something. You kind of have to like certify your device that you have done some basic security hardening before you uh, connect it to the internet. Um, uh. But we're going to come back to the software update problem. Uh, I wanted to first address the this images. How do we work with images? Uh, and I mentioned earlier that th this dominance of ARM, uh, I mean, th there are some weird architectures <laughs> used in embedded. Uh, ARM is the most dominant nowadays, but there's still PowerPC and MIPS, and RISC-V is something that's like coming out right now. And there is no standardization uh, on these devices, uh, which makes it very difficult to work with. Uh, and there's typically something called a board support package, so each board has their unique uh, support package to get it to boot and so on. So this typically means that they have some kind of their own Linux kernel and their own bootloader, uh, which complicates things a lot. I mean, if we just used x86, then it's fairly standardized, but that's not uh, the way it looks. And that's why these like classical binary distributions, so Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, uh, all of these, they are not well suited for these type of devices. And primarily, 
uh, I mean, you cannot use Debian straight out because Debian doesn't really care about this board support package thing or it's not something that they provide packages for. So you still need to build uh, that on your own. Uh, so typically, from my experience at least, binary distributions, you can still use them on these devices, but it's typically for one-off projects, proof of concept, because it's fairly straightforward to work like on a Ubuntu distribution, if you, that's familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but scaling up, there, there's a lot of issues uh, around how do you generate these, like an Ubuntu image, and how do you do it in a reproducible way, and uh, so on. So that's why the solution in, in the embedded market, market has been by creating tools that allows you to build distributions basically from scratch, uh, uh, where your distribution is defined in uh, configuration files or in metadata. Uh, that metadata is uh, version controlled in Git, like source code. Uh, and someone once compared it to like infrastructure as code, which is I think is pretty similar because you don't do anything on the device, so you define your system uh, in, in whatever build system you are using, that's where you define what it contains and so on, and what the output of this build system is an image that contains what you have defined. Uh, so you don't do any changes on the actual device later. Uh, or, uh, yeah, like installing packages and so on. So you kind of define it in a version controlled uh, system what your device is and what it contains, what packages. Uh, and there are some uh, tools that are well used or well established in this uh, to do this. Uh, and there is one tool called the Octo Project, which I'm going to described a bit more in detail, uh, but there's also another one, BuildRoot and OpenVRT, which is maybe something that many of you know about, which is used in uh, routers quite a lot, so that's uh, familiar to people, but the other ones are um, similar in, in how they work. Any questions on this? Yeah, so quickly, the Yocto project is a, is a big project and a big big beast, so I don't really have time to cover it too much in detail. Uh, but it's a project that's based on something called Open Embedded, uh, and Open Embedded has been around you know, since 2003. So, um, and this is, has been the approach of handling um, embedded devices or building devices for a very long time. So it's not something new or this, this has been around for a very long time. Uh, but it con consists of something that, I mean, in, 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 in the Octo world, you have recipes, then you have metadata, and dependency management, configuration, and so on. Uh, but the key thing here, comparing to a binary distribution, is that everything is built from source. Uh, so it, it's not a Linux distribution, so you kind of build your own. Uh, in theory, you could build your Debian uh, using the Octo project. Uh, but the products that, that, that kind of fits into all of this, what I'm trying to explain, is that the output is a root file system image, uh, which can contain your kernel, uh, but you also like a kind of build your tool chain and so on. Uh, and just try, this is a very <laughs> involved, uh, like how, how the Octo project works. Um, but trying to explain it, uh, there's some kind of user configuration or metadata that comes in that describes how you build packages. Uh, and then you kind of do it all from scratch. You fetch the source code of that package, you configure that package, you compile it. Uh, then you package it, uh, and in, the, in Yocto, for example, you can package it as RPM, DEB, or IPK. Uh, you run tests on it, uh, but in the end, you have an image that contains what you have defined uh, with your dependencies that you can, you're going to use in your application. And there's a lot of, I mean, it generates, generates package feeds and stuff like that, uh, but that's getting a bit more advanced in, in So if we move on to the software update challenge, uh, 
that I mentioned earlier, uh, the requirements. Uh, so if you have a device that's installed out there, uh, you want to be able to update all the software components of that device. So both the Linux kernel, your applications, your system binaries, uh, and so on. Um, special considerations to update the bootloader because uh, it's hard to do us to do it safely and have a fallback if something was wrong. Uh, so that needs to be considered extra carefully if one wants to update the bootloader of a device. An update should never render the device unusable or bricked. So if something was wrong, you should always kind of roll back, which is something that I covered earlier. Uh, updates must be atomic. This means that it's installed or not installed, nothing in between. So you don't want to boot something that's 80% complete. Then you're kind of in an undefined state and you don't really know what to expect from that device. And since you are I mean, transferring bytes from a server to a device, you need obviously integrity checks, but it's quite important also to have uh, the possibility to sign your update images so that they are so the client can verify that they are coming from a trusted source. Uh, and it's good to have some kind of compatibility check in, in, in your update packages. So it says this update image is only compatible to this device. So you don't kind of have this problem of accidentally installing it on wrong device and breaking things. Mm. And I mean, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, I covered earlier was this image block-based uh, update, which is easy to implement, easy to test, verify, and maintain. But you kind of have a always have a um, source of truth of your devices. So what you are testing on your device uh, on the bench is what you are actually sending to your device that's in the field. It's identical, so you kind of have a traceability, and it's quite easy to maintain. There is this also downside that you kind of transfer large images, uh, and if you are on meter network and so on, uh, you can complement this with something called binary deltas. So you can uh, the bytes that you transfer from the server are only the difference betw between two images. Uh, so then you can reduce the network uh, load. I already mentioned containers, uh, which kind of solve only solve the application deployment but not all underlying things. Uh, then you have the traditional package managers, like uh, WM package or DNF, uh, that are used on PCs and on servers. Uh, but they are not really designed for this environment uh, in mind from the beginning. And they are not atomic. So you can get 80% updated uh, on your device and then you kind of you're guessing what, if it's going to work or not. Uh, and that's typically why they are not applicable to these type of devices or environments. And then you kind of get, also get into maintenance issues because they need to maintain dependencies. And, uh, and if you have one pack, your, if you package your application as a Debian package, then you kind of maintain dependencies and so on. Uh, that kind of goes away if you kind of build the whole image every time and deploy that as well. And this is where we kind of get into um, the Mender product that we have, uh, which kind of implements all everything that I kind of talked about up, up until now. Uh, so Mender is a uh, over-the-air software update solution. Uh, and it's a client-server implementation. So we both uh, provide the client that you run on device, uh, but also a server management uh, front-end and back-end. So you kind of can manage your deployments and monitor your deployments. And if something goes wrong, you can kind of get reports on uh, that devices have failed to update and so on. Uh, and the, the, the project is open source. Uh, but we implement, we use this um, uh, dual AB partition update scheme strategy. And that way, we kind of achieve robustness if something goes wrong. Uh, Integrity checks, of course. Uh, you can group devices. So you can maybe you have a test group or you group devices based on region. And you kind of can create deployments based on region or, or, or on, on groups. 
And also, I mean, security is important since you are updating the software of devices in the field. Uh, the communication is secure between the client and the server using standard technologies, so TLS or HTTPS. There is a device authentication workflow. So, I mean, a device, when it connects to the vendor server, it's not authorized to do anything until there is trust established, basically. Uh, and we, of course, support, support signed images, so you can like sign your images and the client can verify that it came from you and not from a third party. Yeah, some additional features. So it's a singular complete solution uh, on client and the management server, which kind of bring, bring, I mean, we are not the only ones doing this. There's a lot of solutions out there, open source as well. What's unique to us is that we are doing it end to end. A, a lot of our, there are solutions that are client only or server only. Uh, but since we are end to end, we can also do the testing end to end, ensuring that it works all the way, which is quite a big benefit to have. And of course, I mean, Mendo supports both managed over the air updates, but in some cases, you want to do local updates. Uh, that's supported as well. Uh, and the last thing I would like to mention maybe is that the, the server backend is um, exposed, the functionality expo is exposed using RESTful APIs. And the idea is to make it very easy to integrate with uh, other tools and also like C create CI, CD pipelines. So if you have a built server that's building the images, the build server can upload images automatically to Mender using the APIs and so on. So kind of enabling the CI, CD workflow in these type of devices as well. And we, kinda, we can run on anything that's based on Linux, basically. Uh, but I mentioned some of the tools already. And this is my last slide, so I just wanted to cover a bit and the uh, embedded stack uh, that I already maybe covered in some extent. Uh, but typically what you do in, in these type of devices, you, you have some kind of hardware. I mentioned this board support package. This typically comes from the vendor of the, that board or uh, that you're sourcing. Then you kind of have the operating system, the Linux kernel and the root file system for the system binaries. And this is also where we see OTA updates uh, kind of fit in to this uh, lower stack. Uh, you have some kind of middleware, and at the top you have the applications, and maybe if you have a human interface, which is the product differentiation. Uh, I typically don't want to spend time on these lower uh, components and just reuse components and focus on product differentiation, based essentially. And I think that's it for me, and I will gladly take any questions you might have, if any. Yes? Uh, is there also a vendor or a other tool uh, that does help to code the application that should be running on the devices? And if it is not running, then it goes to the yeah, so the question was, uh, are there health checks in place uh, once you deploy the updates? So yes, th there is in Mender. Uh, I mean, the default health check is, well, the default success criteria is that the client can connect to the server. Then we kind of, okay, then we can always roll out a new update. Uh, but we do we do provide like hooks, so you can hook into this logic, so you can extend it. And you, if you want to check, uh, is my binaries or running connected, and so on, so you can extend this uh, health check. Yes. Is it a community project tool? I mean, it is, it, is it possible to get the source code, have a look, uh, a bit yeah. matches, uh, where is the code hosted on GitHub? Or yeah. GitHub slash Mender software. Hmm? It's not in the slide. Oh. <laughs> How could I miss that? But if you go to our website, you can find the link. But yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, I mean, it's a project that's uh, under Apache 2.0 license. Uh, it's an open core model. 
so we have a fully functional open source product, uh, but we build commercial offerings on top of that. So, for example, we have the server as a SaaS. Uh, if you don't, if you don't want to run your own server, you can use our servers. Yes, for example, that's one commercial offering that we have around the product. Uh, uh, can you tell something about the requirements for the communication channel between client and the server? Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to do it over LoRa or other IoT channels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, uh, if I, um, yeah, are there any alternatives of use the communication channel between the client and the server? Uh, and currently we only support HTTPS, so it's TCP, IP, traffic. Uh, and if you, it has come up, uh, maybe not LoRa, uh, but like MQTT or CoAP uh, has come up. But uh, yeah, we're looking into it, but not something that we have to. And I got the question earlier, and I can repeat it to everyone, uh, since there is like this, uh, we have CF Engine and Mender, uh, and I got the question, is, is Mender built on CF Engine technology or not? Um, and actually, there are completely standalone products, and they don't really share any technology stack right now. Uh, it's something that we are uh, exploring, but uh, we wanted to kind of build a. I mean, there is some overlap between CF Engine and Mender, uh, but we wanted to build the Mender as a standalone, specialized tool to do one thing uh, well. Uh, but right now, we're kind of exploring possibilities of integration. I mean, Mender basically uh, publish images, I mean, complete images of the white CF engine can do point modification in the file system, for mm. example. Mm. So, I mean, in, in, in theory, or in theory, I mean, Mender do, does support, uh, you can do like file updates, I only cover the, the images because that's the robust thing to do. Uh, you can actually deploy a dev package or a tar archive or a file using Mender as well. Okay. Uh, so that's possible. Okay, if there are no questions, thank you very much for listening.